Dear friends, dear partners, much is at stake, as I said in my introduction. I think the platform is more burning than when I was one of my first highlights on climate change in 2009, and for all of us. And much can be achieved if Africa and Europe manage to identify a common agenda ahead of COP28. Comprising more than 42% of the UN's 193 members, the EU and AU together can be at the front of the global agenda setting and should promote joint priorities in the climate change negotiations. To conclude, I look forward to hearing African and European think tanks, critical observation and suggestions. I would like to express my appreciation for our partners at the African Union and the AU member states. I also want to recognize my colleague here from the UN, my colleague Kofi, for a good cooperation and for the good cooperation we have on climate and energy already, and for their openness and commitment to jointly explore how our partnership can be deepened and developed further to help promote the highest possible ambition across the different tracks of the negotiations. All the best. I'll stay as long as I can. I'll follow it because I said we all need to be activists on this. This is a really important issue. Thank you very much. She's there. She's there. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner. Cool to be with us, but you are still muted. So if you can unmute, then we can uh, listen to your speech. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, perfect. Good afternoon, Excellencies. Let me acknowledge the presence of uh, my dear sister, Ambassador Brigitte uh, Marcusen. Uh, EU Ambassador to the African Union and UNECA, and also my dear brother, Ambassador Mohamed Gahad, Ambassador of Egypt to Ethiopia and the African Union. Esteemed panelists, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol duly observed. Let me start by saying happy, by, happy New Year, because we are still in the month of January. So I wish you Happy New Year, all the best for 2023, yourself and to all your entire family. So I would also like to thank, uh, to thank uh, the organizer, the EU and uh, Ambassador Brad for this initiative for inviting me to attend this important uh, meeting. Although I'm currently in Dakar for the African Food uh, Summit Dakar 2, but I consider it quite important to attend this meeting, not just because of the strategic relationship between Africa and the uh, EU, but also for the relevance of the issue being addressed today. It is important for us to establish a clear agenda before COP28, because we just coming from COP27 in Sharmashek, there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of outcome that came out from that group. So we want to start implementing and report on progress that we are making from one COP to another, because going from one COP to another and not achieve anything, it's a failure for us. So with our, our strategic partners, uh, partners who is the EU, I am really appealing that we set a good program, a good roadmap for us to prepare ourselves from the deliverable, uh, the, the, the outcome that came from uh, COP27 and deliver in COP28. So I would just uh, also like to thank uh, the success of my uh, 
some strategic gain that my continent uh, uh, went through because of uh, our common position, the African common position, and our group of African group of negotiators were really very uh, effective. And uh, I congratulate them for that fruitful uh, negotiation with the EU because at least uh, we are looking at the, uh, the approach of uh, adaptation in a more, 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 uh, 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 more urgent issue. We are also putting table the lost and damage. We are also happy that uh, we are going to continue discussion, the mechanism of the implementation, all these and setting up the fund for lost and damage. That was uh, uh, one of the issues that we discussed in the uh, Sharm Shet. All these uh, 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 deliverable we need to implement. We need to implement because it's very important. Uh, set again a difficult uh, uh, geopolitical uh, backdrop. COP27 delivered uh, COP27 results in the country delivering a package of decision that they affirm their commitment to limit the temperature rise to 1.5 industrial level, creating a specific fund for loss and damage mar marked an important point of our progress, like I say. So we need to accelerate those mechanisms of setting up a, a specific fund for loss and damage, which is very important for us due to extreme weather event that we are going through. With the issue added to the official agenda and adopted for the first time at the COP27. So I would like to really commend and uh, uh, congratulate uh, the Republic of uh, Egypt for these, these uh, opportunity, this platform that we all uh, experience. Congratulations for the successful uh, uh, COP that we spent in uh, Shak Shamesh. Government took uh, the groundbreaking decision to establish new fund arrangements as well as a dedicated fund to assist developing countries in responding to loss and damage. Financial pledges were made for loss and damage from new multiple countries, including Austria, Belgium, Canada, France, Germany, and New Zealand, New Zealand, New Zealand joining Denmark and Scotland. Which had which had made pledges previously. Parties also agree on the institute institu 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 sorry institutional arrangement to operationalize the Santiago network for lost and damage to catalyze uh, technical assistance to developing countries that are particularly vulnerable to the abrupt effect of climate change. The sum of uh, uh, to sum up, especially from an African perspective, even though the finance was not uh, forthcoming as expected, Africa made some clear success, successes, especially in our insistence on adaptation as the world is finally listening and uh, finally they acknowledge to set up a fund on lost and damages. But we must act fast so that we will not take another decade to, uh, to set up a, an operational fund from experience of other funds that will be, will be looking like the climate fund. With Europe, sorry, with Europe energy, uh, with Europe, the energy sector is faced, why, sorry, why Europe uh, uh, energy sector is faced uh, an unprecedented crisis with price surging as much as uh, 15 fold last year Part, uh, partly because of the result of the Russian and Ukraine crisis. The EU, the EU, the EU, the EU, the EU supports African stance on the just energy transition. However, there is still continued tension between large emitting countries and the global south, especially on what it entails in the African context particularly with regard to the fossil fuel. There is a strong uh, case made, there is a, a strong case made by Africa to use natural gas as a, strong, a, transi a transition fuel. And we also want to make, to, to, to assure that we want just transition. We cannot get, get rid of this transition because it requires a lot of investment 
for us to change from one transistor, from one type of energy to another, we need investment in this area. COP23 and 28 will make a pivotal shift in global climate action. We must turn ambition into action and collaborate for our four collective interests, building on the gain of the chairmanship of the chairmanship. Both the EU and the African negotiator are a, a sizable scope. And, and they must work together in order to deliver upon all the recommendations that came out during uh, COP27. This is where today's meeting is extremely important so that we can begin to examine the issue of mutual interest in both continents. I look forward to listening to our experts as they dissect the issues, and I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. I have to leave because I have another meeting, bilateral meeting just now. I thank you. Okay, you. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, excellencies and dear colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Let me, of course, first start by thanking uh, our co-organizers, but particularly Ambassador Brigitte Marcusen, the ambassador to the African Union. Uh, the EU has been a particularly strong voice in the debate, but I'm discovering every day some new facets of uh, Ambassador Marcusen engagement on climate as well. So I think uh, Ambassador Marcusen, when she is saying that she has been really an activist, it is true, because uh, not only from what she says, but also you can feel in the discussions, she has been a strong partner of our series that were held throughout last year, the Africa Climate Talks. And we look very much forward to further episodes of these series in the coming year. So just to say thank you, Ambassador Marcusen, and all colleagues in the EU delegation for their leadership role on these very important topics in climate change. I say topics on climate change because, you know, a couple of decades ago, you know, uh, climate change was defined as acid drain, that hole in the ozone in the south. And it was very, very it was a very peculiar and uh, niche topic, but now really, of course, we are on a totally different uh, scale. But let me first also uh, thank our co-organizers from the think tanks, particularly, of course, the African Center for Economic Transformation, the European Center for Development Policy Management, of course, our very dear Institute for Security Studies, and the Policy Center for the New South. Thank you very much. I'll try not to bore you with the statements. So let me start first and say, you know, when I was coming and, and uh, you know, reflecting on uh, this event, there are three points, you know, that, that really um, went on my mind when I thought about this event. The first is the partnership between the African Union and the European Union. Now, of course, Africa and Europe are connected throughout history, really. The first, you know, uh, encounters, what have you, troublesome uh, chapters in our history later on. But fast forward to today, early 21st century, and the European Union is Africa's uh, largest, not only largest uh, economic partner, but uh, politically, culturally, and I would dare say, civilizationally, these two continents are perhaps closest uh, that you can get. So this very strong link is particularly uh, important. Now, to narrow on, on the topic of uh, today, the EU has also been a leader on issues of climate change. Now, on many issues, and there's nothing wrong with that, we don't see eye to eye. We have different priorities given our current socioeconomic situations, of course, which are totally uh, different in many respects. But 
more and more we are realizing that there are common elements in our fight. Climate change, we're having a discussion earlier, is by definition a global challenge. And as such, EU on its own will not be able to deal with it. Africa on its own, and the same goes for all our partners from all the regions. So this is my, the first reflection I have. And the second is that our co-organizers from the think tanks, the civil society, and when I say, you know, give the, the extreme example of the acid drain example in the mid 80s, and all of this, I think what managed to bring climate change on such a platform as, as it is today is thanks to the engagement of the, what you would call the epistemic community. And of course, the activism, the civil society. And you know, really our, our guides in all of these negotiations, we would, you know, I don't want to say um, be uh, perhaps uh, sarcastic and say, you know, we would come back to the nitty gritty of diplomacy, but it's always the IPCC that has kept us, you know, keeping it real, you know, and showing us where the challenges are. And it is thanks to also uh, organizations such as our co-organizers of today that we are maintaining this link between what happens in the negotiation rooms, what the politicians uh, need to deal with, and the reality of uh, the challenges of climate change. The third is the specific topic, climate and energy. I think this is obviously being uh, recognized as the largest potential of the emerging quote unquote green economy, the new uh, opportunities for private investment lies in energy. However, energy colleagues is only half of the story because when we talk renewable energy, when we talk energy, what we're ultimately after is to mitigate. But as Ambassador Marcuse pointed out, as Commissioner Sacco pointed out as well, it's also a matter of the challenges, the impacts. And in this very continent, it's where we feel it the most. The least contribution to the climate change phenomena, but the most impacted by this. And really, I, I would uh, urge maybe, you know, uh, my colleagues that next uh, stipend, I know Kathleen, you've got, you mentioned three or four, but I think the next one we should do should address the adaptation challenge. So these are the three reflections. Now, if you allow me a little bit of boring uh, recital, I hope not to make it too boring. <laughs> and if you would recall COP27 was being held in a very strenuous, to say the least, global context. Not only did it entail the energy and the food crisis, but also recovery from the pandemic, as well as a global context where, contrary to previous COPs, the major emitters were not on speaking terms. So we came to Sharm and we, need, we really didn't know how the conditions were going to be. Are we going to have an arrangement whereby the major emitters had, you know, uh, a semblance of a way forward that would help all of us in finding a way forward? So that's the context, you know, we have to uh, bear that in mind. Uh, COP27, therefore, you know, faced quite some challenges. There was a dire need to strike a delicate balance as well on the content of the agenda between acting on emissions without delay, more on that later, rebalancing action in the climate tracks to respond to development needs. And that definitely was, you know, one of the leading calls that you would uh, recall from the developing world, the expectation that Africa was hosting a COP, all of this really made a very strong case to have uh, an agenda that reflected the, the, the diversity of issues. And I'm talking, you know, adaptation, I'm talking loss and damage, 
I'm talking climate finance. And seeing also more inclusive participation in the climate discourse. You have the state parties, the blue zone, but you've got the other zones, the other, you know, contributors, what we're just uh, speaking of now. So let me tackle this very last issue about participation. I think, you know, COP27 and Sharm el-Sheikh really set new records, both number-wise, and, you know, we have to, at some point, realize that we can't keep on uh, going about numbers because then we are going to have a serious uh, footprint issue in these conferences. But nonetheless, it reflects the engagement and it reflects the keen interest to be in such. Of course, as you all know, it's the largest uh, multilateral gathering uh, uh, in, in the year. But qualitatively, I, I think. And there were some extremely well thought out, well uh, uh, solutions that were being presented about the participation of civil society from Africa. Civil society presence in the UNFCCC is heavily slanted to the global north, if we can call it as such. So there was a keen interest on having the participation of CSOs from the global south. And, you know, of course, the, the rules of the UNFCCC need to be respected. But we were able to develop a very ingenious method of having a one stop uh, registration for 57 African civil society organizations. You know, of course, we've got the processes that they need to go through, but this was high priority organizations that were very keen to attend and we managed to uh, create that vehicle. And we think it's a vehicle that shouldn't only stop at COP27. Uh, despite the headwinds that we were just talking about, we were uh, also able to see high participation and political commitment from the leaders. We had over 110 uh, leaders, state leaders participating, which again reflects, despite all the challenges, that there was a real uh, commitment uh, from there. Now, again, back to the, uh, the quality of participation, there was also, I think, a keen interest and a strong presence of youth at, at COP27. And we give really uh, credence to the COP27 youth envoy, the first such youth envoy, and we're happy that the, uh, our uh, partners in the UAE have taken up this and already have appointed a COP28 youth envoy as well. Uh, despite this very challenging situation that we spoke about earlier, and going back to the first point about mitigation and the emissions reduction, uh, COP27, Sharm el Sheikh kept the 1.5 degrees Celsius goal alive. And we hope that going through to COP28, it will not only be kept alive, but, you know, uh, trying to find ways forward in terms of making that goal as realistic as uh, can be. Uh, in fact, under the breakthrough agenda, of Sharm el Sheikh. Countries representing more than 50% of global GDP set out sector specific priority actions to decarbonize power, transport and steel, scale up low emission hydrogen production, and accelerate the shift to sustainable agriculture by COP28. And also as one of the legacies of COP27, the long awaited, of course, establishment of a loss and damage fund. The idea of loss and damage, dear colleagues, was actually present in 1992 when the UNFCCC was launched. And it took us, sadly enough, 30 years to come up with a, a structure, come up with the fund. This is just the beginning. As Ambassador Marcuzin pointed out, it's not going to be easy. There are a lot of competing 
uh, agendas in the climate field as well. But for Africa, for developing country, for the least developed countries, for the small island developing uh, states, I think that was a very significant development in the history of the UNFCCC. We can go to lengths and other important outcomes of uh, for all the parties and the stakeholders. However, let me focus on the affirmation that climate change cannot undermine, nor will it, development aspirations for Africa. If you recall a while back, there was always a discourse that climate vis-a-vis -vis development. I think this discourse is now part of history and no serious observer, practitioner, you know, would doubt that both need to go hand in hand. The convention has repeatedly linked ambitious action on climate change with the availability of finance, technology transfer, and other means of implementation. That has been Africa's call for climate justice and will continue to shape the continent's position. Now, in light of this EU-AU partnership, we can see the feasibility of more cooperation on the following. And I have for you seven points that I think can set the way forward in the coming year as we head towards COP28. First, standing together in the call for reforming multilateral institutions and availing concessional and predictable access to finance, possibly during the coming spring meetings of the World Bank and the IMF. Second, giving more focus to implementing capacity building programs in planning for adaptation, resilience, and access to finance. The African Union can be an actual vehicle given its convening power and the abundance of existing strategies and frameworks. And really, let me take this opportunity to salute uh, Commissioner Sacco. Uh, despite the strong convening power of the AU, yet the resources that she deals with are quite uh, finite, you know, to say the least. And I think that a lot more support should be given to uh, the AU in general, and of course, Commissioner Sacco being uh, the department uh, perhaps most directly relevant to these issues. Third, expanding cooperation with AU member states on accessing climate friendly investments and enable more access to private and just finance. Fourth, continuing engagements on just energy pathways while considering the socioeconomic and scientific factors and engaging in the just transition work program. Fifth, steering clear from policies that may undermine nascent renewable energy markets, particularly in Africa. You know, always startups need to be nurtured. And I think for the success of a lot of renewable energy markets in Africa, this should be a priority. Sixth, keeping the momentum on loss and damage and achieving progress on modal modalities of financing of the fund by COP28. If we can go to COP28 with some traction behind us on the setting up of the loss and damage fund, I think this would be the most significant trust contribution from our global partners in the north to the process. And finally, uh, dear colleagues, ensuring that confidence between all parties persists, including addressing all tracks of actions, mitigation, adaptation, finance, and loss and damage. I think to conclude, let me say that COP27, as in all other uh, COPs, responded and delivered on multiple calls, sometimes competing. And the incremental nature of COPs necessitates coordination and keeping sight of progress. In this vein, the COP27 presidency will continue to engage with all parties and stakeholders 
and we will be fully supportive of the upcoming COP28 presidency to ensure the continuity of work. Egypt will also seek to benefit from Africa's strong presence in COP27 to strive towards delivering continental priorities. I look very much forward to the outcomes from the discussions and earlier uh, today from this workshop and reiterate our readiness to explore further avenues of cooperation among uh, yourselves, the attendees. And let me take this opportunity to announce that uh, the COP27 team, the lead negotiators, will be in town. They will be at Addis Ababa early next week, 30th and 31st. Uh, of course, it would be a pleasure to have you all in the various events. Our program coordinator for that will be my colleague Ahmed. If you want to stand up, Ahmed, so colleagues can uh, find you. And again, I want to thank Ahmed because he has been really uh, a very steadfast supporter of the African Climate Talks uh, throughout the course of last year. Again, thank you very much, Ambassador uh, Birgit. Thank you all, dear colleagues, for uh, organizing this. And uh, keep strong and uh, see you very soon in other events on climate change. Thank you very much. You, uh, thank you very much, um, Ambassador. I want to start with thanking uh, thanking Ambassador Markison and Commissioner Sacco and Ambassador Gad for their introductions and uh, sort of pointing to some of the opportunities for the Africa uh, Europe partnership, and also some of the tensions. And now, definitely, also uh, a very clear list of recommendations, which I think uh, makes my job a lot easier, uh, perhaps a bit more difficult, depending on how you. Uh, how you look at it. Um, but we're, we're so I'm, I'm often to meet in here from the European Centre for Development um, Policy and Management um, based in Brussels. And for us, this has been, been a very great opportunity to be able to strengthen connections, uh, not, not only with the diplomatic level here in, in Addis, but also strengthen connections with our partners from, uh, from the different uh, think tanks. And I think we've had um, a very fruitful conversation and discussion um, this morning and a, and a successful launch of this new consortium. So for us, this really is the start of a way for us to uh, join hands and, and, and be stronger in our engagement as think tanks uh, in this, this crucial uh, project. So I'll try to be very brief in terms of my, my um, sort of feedback from the session, because I think we're all waiting for uh, the panel discussion that, that will follow. But, but sort of maybe one sort of main conclusion that, that I think we um, we sort of had from the, from the session, and that's perhaps to use an overused term in international relations, we're sort of at a make or break uh, moment uh, for this partnership. I think we're all, we've all, or, or many of many of us have been part in some way or another uh, of, of COP27, and we really appreciate the feedback also from, from the negotiations. And indeed, I mean, this took place in a, in a very tense and, and Times also quite, quite pessimistic um, environment. But the overall sense that, that we're coming away with is that some doors have been uh, opened, not least the symbolic initial agreement on, on loss and damage. But at the same time, there's quite a, a few doors that remain either half open or uh, sometimes also quite painfully uh, closed in terms of real uh, strong progress in, uh, on, on, on climate finance, uh, which, which I think needs to be mentioned and has been mentioned. So at the same time, um, I think one of the things that, that came out as well is that for this multilateral process to uh, be credible and to be a credible bridge between developing countries uh, in the global south and larger emitters, this Europe-Africa partnership in way uh, will and can be quite essential. So in a way now more than ever, there's a lot riding on this partnership and collaboration to deliver in terms of common position. That's that's also something that I'm asking. And have have both uh, also uh, spoken to, uh, and I think this is what what will be enable it to uh, show real ambition, climate justice, or just energy transition, on climate finance, on adaptation. So today's meeting uh, that we had, we focus on two key issues: climate finance, and just energy transition. This is definitely only uh, one part of the 
the climate of change. But these are issues that we think um, are of particular importance today and, and, and opportunities also to unpack this a bit more and make sure that, that we can take it towards sort of um, ambitious action ahead of, uh, ahead of COP28. So very briefly, a couple of takeaways on those two areas. I think the loss and damage negotiations that came out very clearly in the, in the meeting this morning is they are really seen as a major opportunity to create new momentum. I think momentum was used by several people, uh, speakers before uh, on climate justice, uh, but at the same time, we're standing in front of a very challenging road ahead to move uh, this, this, this concept in a way from principle to a proof of concept in reality. I think the Af African and, and European partners can play a very significant role in putting pressure from within uh, and tackling the operationalization. Some of the issues that were raised um, by the different experts is, is, is first of all, uh, very much a need for ensuring broad enough definition. Of loss and damage because there are opportunities uh, for for the to happen. That's that's going to be a very important part of the conversation. Um, uh, another sort of recommendation suggestion has been to to try and, and make sure that this is not only approached in a process driven way um, as part of uh, as part of the, the triple C process, but also with clear intention that it's adapted to the diverse reality of. What is climate vulnerability across different African countries? Because there's an extremely different uh, experience for, uh, for, for various countries. I think part of that is, is also pointing to the need to ensure that any new mechanism is going to be well situated among, but also not buried under uh, the full spectrum of different interventions that are tackling climate vulnerability. So, this is really the question of additionality and making sure that this is linked to. Very ambitious action on also pointing towards sort of the, the very difficult sticking points of uh, sovereign debt reform, uh, which is uh, which is again uh, sort of uh, very much uh, pointing to uh, sort of reinforcing uh, climate vulnerability. Um, so, big conclusion: time is very short, which is, I think is part of your day-to-day -day reality. Uh, in any case, but as one of the participants said, this this is not something that should be coming in when the island has sunk. So I think I think the, the time pressure is very much on, um, and we on, we not only think that the EU and African countries through this partnership can make a serious contribution towards this operationalization, formulating I think what was said um, a, a minimum standard of operationalization, minimum standard so, uh, in, in in terms of delivering. Agenda. We also think that this is going to be critical, and I think the word has been used before critical in order to build uh, and create a new level of trust between uh, and uh, So I think this, this is something that should not be underestimated. Um, a second, second area that we've been working on and that will be also part of the discussions moving forward here today is just energy transition. Um, it's again an area where we feel that there's a lot of significant progress that has been made, rapid developments, uh, a lot of uh, sort of success, uh, success, rapid succession of announcements and uh, investment, not least in terms of renewable energy. Um, but it's also, and that has been mentioned before again, it's also something that's often overshadowed by existing tensions on fossil fuels, very much exacerbated by the uh, war in Ukraine and the current. Uh, what is uh, a major energy uh, security and energy crisis in so there's there's a sense that um, that europe africa partnership uh, is already playing a significant role again not least in investment it can also be um, uh, the a particular use to support improving the channeling of uh, finance for critical but also very much cross-border infrastructure and that has been, been a very, very big part of the conversation at this point. We also think that, that there's, there's, a, there's a, 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 an opportunity for this partnership and for the collaboration between the two blocks to support and inform what, what we call a deep decarbonization of African countries. And doing that in a way that creates new opportunities in industrialization, new opportunities uh, in uh, economic transformation and, and job uh, creation. 
I think this very much resonates with some of the points that you raised uh, before. But what this also means, it means uh, working very closely with member states, member states uh, in, in Africa, member states in, in Europe, on formulating uh, new, uh, better adapted, and more strategic industrial policies, facilitating technology transfer again, as I mentioned before, facilitating investment, but also creating, uh, as, as, as has been mentioned many times, creating new better incentives for investment. For a stronger mutual cooperation, because that is one of the areas that uh, has been has been mapped. Finally, um, final point on this uh, natural gas is always a uh, very sensitive issue, very much part of the conversation when we talk about climate and energy in North Africa. Um, and I think one of the one of the points that came out of the uh, out of the meeting is that the way forward is perhaps less in that sort of eternal tug of war between questions of fossil fuels or, uh, or renewable, much more in sort of going, uh, going deep into the conceptualization of what it is to, um, to, to have transition fuels in specific applications. Sort of uh, contextualize that just energy transition um, uh, concept in a way that really, really uh, is, is better adapted to the reality of economic transformation in African, uh, African economies. Uh, and then a final, final point on where I think think tanks and, and research community play a significant role is that data not only on um, uh, not only climate data but also data on feasible climate safe pathways for uh, African uh, European energy systems and that's I think also a way uh, area in which which the, or on which Europe Africa partnership can actually build to uh, to move towards this sort of uh, common position. Um, and I also final final point I want to stress that for us as as think tanks, this is not simply a series of empty recommendations. They very much uh, guide the work that we already do uh, in specific uh, country settings settings in um, in, in Brussels, in, in, in capital cities in which we're based. To just give a, a, a few quick examples at ECDPM for example, we're now uh, in the process of launching <coughs> transition, looking at opportunities for green manufacturing. We're also working on how to strengthen the climate finance agenda, linking it much more structurally also to issues of uh, uh, sovereign debt reform and debt sustainability. Uh, the colleagues at, uh, at the Africa Center for Economic Transformation have a very strong focus on climate finance uh, agenda. They're very, very um, sort of uh, very active also in the conversation on finance for adaptation. But they're also, and this has been mentioned before, they're also working on uh, how to reform to natural development uh, in a way that they are So, more adapted to uh, the challenges ahead. And ASET, for example, is, is organizing a meeting in Kigali specifically on that. At the Policy Center for the New South, um, the, uh, they have a very strong economics agenda. Very much working on deep decarbonization, in particular uh, also uh, I think it's really interesting for this audience is that uh, we're also very much uh, one of the groups in African analysis on the effects of uh, European transition um, and the European external agenda, for example, analysis on policies like our border adjustment linkages, fallout of the energy crisis on uh, in Europe. And then finally, uh, ISS, our partner based here in, 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 in Addis, has very exceptional expertise on climate change and human security. And I think that, that, that we haven't been able to discuss this today, it's a touchy part of it. But uh, the link between, between climate change, human security, and resource costs that, that, that uh, is, uh, is very strong. So for us, this really has been an opportunity to try and explore a bit more synergies between the work that we do, better target uh, uh, some of our some of our initiatives in countries in uh, uh, in Addis, and to try and translate uh, translate our engagement uh, in a way that it, it also feeds into the community. So with that, um, thank you very much, and hand over to uh, John for.
Uh, can I have um, John Paul? Yeah. And Professor Jody, please come on. So good afternoon, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, um, including those of us, uh, those online. Uh, my name is Zero. Yes. So my name is John Asafuwa I'm a senior fellow at the African Center for Economic Transformation, and I'll be moderating this panel. Um, this afternoon, we are, we are very privileged to have an expert panel. Um, so on my immediate left is um, uh, Jean-Paul uh, Adam, uh, who's a technical director here at um, uh, ECA. Uh, next to him is Professor uh, Larry Bijaidi, who is a senior fellow with the Policy Center for the New South. Um, and we've got two other participants who will be joining us uh, online. Um, so we've got um, um, Sebastian, Dr. Sebastian Stell, uh, I hope I've pronounced your name correctly, who is with the World Resources Institute of Africa. Uh, and then we have Elizabeth uh, Heck, who is a senior fellow with uh, IDRI. Uh, so you're all welcome, uh, uh, panelists. Uh, time is really far gone, and uh, I'd like to make allowance for uh, contributions from the floor. Um, so I, I will um, ask the panelists to be quite brief in their, uh, uh, you know, interventions, so that we can have time uh, for the for the uh, floor as well as to the line. Um, so we need to be out of here by six o'clock to try try and keep to that time. Um, so a lot has been said today. And I'd like to start off with my first question. Um, building on the gains of COP27, how can the common agenda be developed for the EU AU partnership? So, for example, you know, one of the outcomes was the re resolution to boost low emissions energy. Uh, could that be the basis for developing a common agenda? And I would like to ask, um, get the African perspective uh, from the gentleman sitting here, and then I'll go to um, those online, the panels online, to give us the uh, European perspective. Uh, so let me start off with John Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John, and it's, uh, I'm delighted to be able uh, to be here uh, with everyone. Everyone can hear me? Seems okay. Uh, so I think that there is certainly a common agenda between Africa and Europe in terms of delivering a just transition. But I think we also need to understand the differences in needs. And certainly in the African context, the language that has emerged from COP27 is of a just transformation rather than a just transition. Because I'm sure many of you heard in Sharm El Sheikh, we are transitioning from what? Uh, Africa represents less than 4% of global emissions currently. And if you focus also to remove Northern Africa from that equation and South Africa, then Africa is actually less than 1% of global emissions. And the other side of that coin is that 600 million, almost 600 million people still do not have access to electricity. So the focus in Africa has to be on the fastest route towards achieving energy access. And the framing of a just transition or a just transformation should be around achieving that access. Now, the good news is that in the vast majority of cases, renewables offer the best and fastest solution and the most affordable solution to achieve that energy access. But we have to recognize that in some cases, uh, there has to be a much wider mix of energy to be able to achieve that transition. And therefore, and I think many African countries at COP and elsewhere have expressed frustration that there seems to be a lack of understanding of what that energy mix will actually look like and that it will be different in different countries. So some countries, we are in Ethiopia, which has huge renewable energy uh, opportunity and is already doing a lot in terms of the hydropower, will probably 
be able to meet a lot of its requirements through renewable energy. But other countries that do not have base, trans base uh, generation capacity will have to have a more uh, nuanced mix, which includes in some cases increasing initial fossil fuel investment. But I think where the alignment is on a transformation is that the big business opportunity in terms of investment is going to be in Africa. And where we are going to be able to deliver in a common way is that we also do not look at this as simply an extractive opportunity where Europe can buy energy cheaply or where uh, it can sell its energy technology, but rather a proper investment in sustainable energy value chains in the continent. Uh, thank you. Let, let me hand over to Professor J.D. Thank you. I think that uh, Europe and uh, Africa are uh, struggling to find a common response to uh, a great challenge. And uh, the COP27 is an opportunity to, uh, have a, to, to present some common uh, answers. Uh, but in the world, actually, uh, of uh, increasing uh, carbon emissions, a geopolitical conflict and, uh, and inflation, a record inflation, rising energy and food prices, uh, and the growing debt crisis also. Uh, many African countries lack the resources to deal with the repercussions of the uh, climate change. And Europe Africa cooperation can be an instrument for uh, global climate action uh, and common response to this challenge. In the recent years, the African continent, uh, responsible for less than 4% uh, of global emissions, as you say, has come forward with uh, a strong, benefit position on its needs. The African Union's uh, climate strategy uh, asks for support for adaptation. African countries are also calling for a just transition that supports their right to develop, the right to develop uh, their economies, to diversify their economies, and uh, including by uh, leveraging their fossil fuel reserves, particularly natural gas. But also, there is a challenge, and uh, in Africa, we have uh, another plan, uh, was uh, in 2021, I think, on uh, recovery, a green economy. And uh, I think that, uh, on the two sides, we can have uh, a common view for uh, the future, the future international application of the European uh, Green Deal. Also, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a new new new, new reality, and uh, EU's uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism is emerging as the symbol of what uh, is seen as uh, a deeply uh, unfair and unilateral European Union foreign policy. So we have uh, a large uh, uh, theme or issues to find and to build a common vision for the other, for the future. Thank you, Professor. Um, let me ask uh, Sebastian, uh, who is online, to react, and then we will move on to Elizabeth after that. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I hope you can hear me well. Um, yes, loud and clear. Excellent. Uh, so, in my view, I would say that this kind of partnership can be a, a big opportunity and success for both the African Union and the European Union. But if and only if uh, we manage to bring more nuance into the debate around energy transitions on the African continent, because for too long, these discussions have been dominated by, um, by undeserved, uh, let's say, uh, generalizations or making the debate black and white, 
uh, as if, you know, natural gas, yes or no, big hydro, yes or no. Um, as if, as if these things are black and white choices, uh, as well as by unhelpful searches for uh, one size fits all solutions, which in reality will not apply. Um, uh, you hear, you hear people say that uh, every African country could power its, uh, its electricity or could meet its electricity demand. X times over with uh, it's with the solar irradiation it receives every year. That may be true, but we know that the African continent is the best endowed continent in terms of solar resources. But that is not the answer to any any important question in uh, in this debate on energy transitions. Every country will have uh, its own narrative, its own storyline in terms of what the energy transition means. The energy transition in South Africa, for instance, um, will have a lot to do with the coal phase out and just transition for uh, for for people with the coal industry and so on. That is not what energy transition will mean in Ethiopia or in Senegal. Energy transition means something different for every country. And it is important that we, we don't see um, the, 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 we don't make the mistake of seeing the continent as one homogeneous block where every country is facing the same challenges and therefore needs the same solutions. Uh, we need to ask the right questions on each on the level of each individual country and for some countries um you know this solar thing will apply and they will they will they will build out electricity systems with a lot of solar pv um and for other countries maybe not huh? for other countries it may be hydro for other countries it may be gas and a mix of other things on the short term um uh, every country will have a different pathway towards industrialization every country will have a, a different pathway towards clean cooking and towards clean transportation and we need to be mindful of these of these differences uh, research in the last years has helped a lot in you know um, providing data and providing numbers on uh, overall potential and overall needs uh, for for the African continent and it is great and we have learned a lot from it but the time has now come to um, to move to country level narratives and storylines and tailored approaches that are helpful to policymakers in in each country I'll leave Thank it you. I think the point on uh, diversity on the continent is very important, and uh, that is very well taken. Uh, let's hear from Elizabeth now. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Great, thanks. Yes, I think that uh, in the in the um, introductions by the different ambassadors, I think a lot has been said also on on the winds of, winds of COP twenty seven on loss and damage and the call for reform of in, um, international financial institutions. But we know that, yeah, that actually the question on energy and the energy language or, or in the language on phasing out fossil fuels was not, it was a more tricky issue and not necessarily um, a win of uh, COP27. So, but I am very much agree that uh, with what Sebastian has said, that there is this need for a more nuanced debate. And I think that going for COP28, we need to have a lot of these, these difficult and nuanced debates. Um, um, I also think that it's important to recognize that it, that Africa and Europe are not two blocks on, on these discussions, but there are different voices within uh, both continents. And um, uh, a Senegalese uh, researcher uh, recently said, you know, they are working on the, on the Just Energy Transition Partnership deal uh, with uh, international donors, including Europe. And, and uh, so he's trying to provide also evidence for what could be a, a different energy pathways for, for Senegal. And he says, you know, there are people who are battling for um, development first and that and those that are battling for, for quality of development. And I think in Europe, we have uh, also the same. We have those who battle for industry first and those who battle for quality of industry. And um, I think what we don't need is Europe choosing industry first and telling Africa that they have, have to go for quality for development, but we need to conversions on, on, on the quality debates. And I also think it's Im important that uh, uh, in the collaborations, we start with African driven initiatives and there are energy transition plans be, uh, being made in different countries. There's, there's the, um, the initiative made by Egypt on just transi transitions being made for Africa. And I think these are important or well, hydrogen strategies by the countries, important starting points. And I think it's also, I mean, it's it's good that Europe also has the offer of the Global Gateway and the Africa uh, energy uh, package which, which within that. But I think it's important to have this uh, African narratives and to not do the same mistakes that in the past where we had 
uh, momentum in, at the at 20 at the COP21 with the Africa U, uh, Renewables Energy Initiative, which was an Africa narrative for renewables, and then the the financing commitments didn't follow up. So I think it's good that we recognize that there are these African initiatives, and we take this as a starting point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the point on African driven narratives uh, was also emphasized uh, at a workshop um, uh, this morning that, that we had. Uh, so I'd like us to go a little bit deeper into the just, uh, just energy transition. Uh, so my first set of questions uh, is to uh, the panel who are with me here fiscally, um, and uh, they're both um, from Africa. So my question is, what are the challenges that African governments face in the net zero transition? So I'll start with uh, Professor Jaini and I'll come to Jean Paul. I think that the, the first challenge is, uh, uh, is the, to have a, a common point of view and a, a common proposition of Africa in, uh, um, in, in the development of, uh, of uh, this project of uh, loose and uh, damage. Because I think that it, is, it will be, uh, it should be an instrument for uh, iniquity and the justice cli uh, climate, you know, the climate. So uh, I think that uh, Africa has to to, to, co to to develop coordination in all the countries uh, to clarify how this uh, this uh, this phone will will work. Uh, its design. Architecture, the governance of uh, of the system, and the relation between the fund and other uh, financial uh, canals in the private or public uh, sources, and so on. And I think that it is important to have an identification of uh, uh, what are the countries, the area. Uh, to allocate the the, the, the resources in 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 the pertinent way. Uh, well, it is the, the first the first I think the first challenge. The second challenge is to push uh, in the future uh, COP uh, to uh, adaptation to a program of adaptation uh, because I think that in uh, in uh, in Sharmshir. Uh, it is not uh, uh, really uh, its progress. We observe a progress, but it's not really uh, uh, at uh, the acceptation of, of, of uh, the African countries, because uh, it is a big challenge, because that adaptation is not in, 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 uh, in it is in the long term, and uh, uh, it is a uh, reformation of, of the economies of Africa, and it is uh, relied to other politic, public policies in the countries and uh, on uh, regional level and continental level. Uh, the third uh, challenge for me is the nexus between energy and uh, food security, because it is uh, what uh, it is one of the the great challenge of, uh, of, of, uh, of African countries. And we have to, 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 to take in account this, uh, this challenge because you can use our resource. Uh, it is maybe, uh, it's not a great emission in, in Africa, but uh, we have the possibility to come be, between uh, traditional resource, fossil resource and uh, uh, renewed uh, uh, energy uh, source. This is, uh, I think, that the third very big challenge of Africa. Thank you, um, uh, Professor. So let's have John Paul's uh, remarks. No, thank, thank you very much. I, um, I come from the Economic Commission for Africa, so I always start with the finance problem um, because I also believe that when we have seen big transformations um, in modes of production, for example, quite often it's the finance that, that sets the agenda. 
uh, by having the right financing environment, you create the incentive for a lot of the other changes that need to happen. And Africa, unfortunately, has been left behind, particularly in the financing that is available for investment in renewables. Um, and figures available for just up to the pandemic 2020, less than 2% of global investment in renewables was in Africa. So even though the big potential is here, investors don't follow through for a variety of reasons. Uh, some of it is the, the market is not very well developed and investors, even though they can get a very good return on investment, um, they may see the, the ability to pay being less. There is less industry and you have the chicken and the egg scenario in many scenarios. But the availability of secured, reliable flows of finance would be one of the biggest drivers to actually allow the investment to, to take place. And this is also linked to the risk perception that is associated with investing in Africa, where many um, big investors that may wish to come in on public private partnerships, for example, um, and when the government is associated, the governments in Africa will often be paying what is sometimes referred to as the Africa premium. Um, a country that may be similarly rated to, let's say, a European uh, uh, peer, uh, in terms of rating here, I'm speaking of the credit rating from international agencies, but will still end up paying an interest rate which is at least one or two percentage points higher. Uh, and that cost is often a barrier when, uh, when, when, uh, when investment is scarce. And in the current environment, where there is a flight to safety, that phenomenon is exacerbated. So you have even less investment likely to go into what are seen as risky markets. And this is where, and I think the opportunity, we're looking at the partnership between the EU and Africa, is to drastically use uh, risk guarantees. And this I know has been announced as part of the Global Gateway, uh, the, the EU um, uh, Global Gateway uh, initiative. Uh, and I think we need to find ways that these are deployed at, at massive scale uh, to allow these investments to happen in renewable energy uh, across the, the continent. The final point I will make is also, uh, and I, this is why I insist on the point of transformation rather than transition. Because if we can build economic models that themselves are linked to the production of energy, and this means, for example, 70% of the world's cobalt, which is essential for batteries, is sourced from the DRC. The majority of, is, of it is, is currently processed in terms of battery precursors in Asia, some of it in Europe and most of it in Asia. If we were to, we did a study that showed that in the DRC, if we were to move the production of battery precursors in the DRC, it would cost 30% less and it would emit 30% less. So moving these kinds of production chains to Africa, but this depends on the owners of these technologies, quite a few are in Europe, to make that jump and to make that commitment to bring the technology uh, to, the, to the countries. And, and this is where uh, the dilemma that sometimes African countries are facing is not always understood. And our final point, I'll just use an example from my own country, I'm from Seychelles. So there's been oil prospection in Seychelles for a while. Um, and every time the price globally goes above $100 per barrel, you have more prospectors that come. And I always say everyone, it's never going to happen because the depth at which this is, is the oil is found means that it will never actually be competitive, particularly when you look at the lowering price of renewables. But for all developing countries, as soon as there is a sense that you can make some money from oil and gas, there is no shortage of investors that are at your doorstep, usually with checks. And compare that with less than 2% renewable energy investment in Africa up until 2020. So that's where we need to change. Thank you very much, um, um, Jean-Paul. Uh, I'd like to go to our online panel, and um, I'd like to get a European perspective. Um, and my question is, what can the EU do to support Africa's energy transition? Um, especially, you know, given what has happened at COP27, uh, initiatives like the Just and Affordable Energy Transition Initiative uh, that was launched. Uh, what, um, what can the EU do to catalyze uh, all these uh, uh, commitments. So let me start with Elizabeth and then I'll come to um, Sebastian. Yes, thank you. Um, 
I'd like to take maybe a particular angle here also on on the the possibility of having chest energy transition partnerships um because this is something that uh, I have worked on in in the context of uh, our uh, think tank platform Ukama which is a Africa Europe think tank platform that Idri has launched together with the Professor Okoreke from Afuna University in Nigeria. Um, and I think it's it's important to recall that the JETP started in, in Africa with South Africa. And then uh, at the AU EU summit, there were actually several countries mentioned for, for potential investments in, in just energy transitions also in African countries. And then the, the discussion kind of moved more to, to Asia and um, apart from, from the Senegalese negotiations that are, are going on. and. Um, at the beginning, when the uh, the chest energy transition partnerships, or when you ask European donors about what is the idea behind this, they said it, it's mostly the idea was um, to move countries away from coal. Um, so it's still a bit of a mystery why there is Senegal in, in, in the mix, but I think it's a very important, it could be a very interesting blueprint to have the Senegalese chest energy transition partnership. Uh, because we need innovative financing, not just for, for moving away from coal, but for also for actually creating um, energy, uh, sustainable energy access and, and sustainable industrialization in, in African countries. So I think that's that's important. It will be important to follow what will come out uh, of the Senegalese um, um, example. And we have uh, actually uh, worked together with uh, experts from South Africa, Senegal and, and also Nigeria. Uh, to look at what would actually be a successful collaborations on just energy transitions and what would they actually need kind of to organize also around. And there were three important things that came out. The first was the need for, for a solid energy transition plan, a long-term plan. And um, we have this example from S South Africa where this worked well, also backed by, and that's the second point, by uh, in-country independent evidence and analysis, uh, analysis. and uh, I think this is something where also Europe should invest in. And we have been talking about this with European partners. Sometimes also the response, I think many agree, but sometimes also you get the response, well, but this takes time building up this, uh, also this, uh, this uh, in-country um, capacity, research capacity. In South Africa, you have very well established think tanks in academia. It's not always the case, but I think it's, even if it takes time, it's worthwhile. And um, because we also had the example of Nigeria where, the, where there were actually also um, in uh, country uh, research going on in the context also, of, for example, of a deep decarbonization pathway project. But then to accelerate the dynamic, it was uh, the energy transition plan is mostly based on, on a private consultancy scenarios. And these data are private. Um, it's not necessarily the, the, the result of a, of a broad debate and so on. And uh, now um, this energy transition plan of Nigeria is not getting a, a lot of response from donors. And, and there's also, also a lot of questions on, on the quality of the plan. So I think it's important we cannot, uh, even if it takes time, it's important to invest in this in-country research capacities and, and evidence. And the third and last point is um, is that if, if uh, Europe wants to ask countries to really do this step uh, change transitions or transformations, as Jean-Paul has said, then it also should come with a step change in the finance, in the amounts and also the modalities. And a lot of response that we get at the moment is that JETPs will be about public seed money, but that most of it should come from private investments. And as Jean-Paul has said, there are many questions around that um, and it will not be magical. And I think we really need to uh, work this uh, out um, and not just uh, um, make announcements like this. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, um, yes, Sebastian. Yes, thank you very much. I'll, I'll keep it brief, but I would say that the most important thing that the European Union side can do here is to provide clear signals uh, towards towards the investment side based on long term visions uh, and not based on short term circumstantial dynamics. So just as an example, what we saw earlier last year. Uh, what happened was that um, that European leaders started knocking on the doors of countries like Senegal uh, for for you know as potential partners in natural gas exploration for exports exports to Europe. And on the short term, of course, these are these are uh, very attractive 
ideas uh, for, for many countries. It provides a, a way to earn to earn revenue on the short term. But if the if the reasoning behind that from the European side is based on something that is that was not planned, that was a a, a, a circumstance in the moment, uh, the the fear of a, of a gas shortage, then uh, there's a risk of this kind of flip flop policy, you know, um, where where it's not there's no clear long term vision uh, for for what kind of investments investments are needed. Uh, and that carries risks on the long term. Uh, for example, if anyone is left with stranded assets in the long term, when the demand isn't there anymore, because it was circumstantial to start with, then who owns that risk? Huh? And this is something that, uh, that that should not happen. The energy transitions across Africa should not be left at the whim of um, circumstances elsewhere in the world. There has to be a clear long term commitment and vision. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Now, time is really moving fast. So I'd like to get some questions from the floor uh, and also if we can get some lined up from the, our online audience. Uh, so I would like to uh, invite participants to put questions to the, any of the panelists uh, on what they've said or maybe any new issues, but like, let's try and stick to the issues that we will talk about. I can see there's a hand at the back. Um, or maybe you talk to them. Yeah, so any questions um, for the panelists from the floor? Yes, so there are two hands up. Let's go here and then uh, there's one hand. Thank you. Thank you for that. That was my question is a bit off for the discussion on the other. But it's related because uh, in a sense, most of the discussions focused on financial and technical issues. And I think it is the same solutions that brought us to this problem. We say, in our quest to offer solutions to our problems, we focus on innovation, you know, uh, finance, technical solutions. We haven't talked much on the human will side. You know, the, the human uh, participation, the way. And uh, when and uh, what are we doing in this space? When does it start? Because unless we work on things for the technical and the financial solution, it's not much. Okay. Um, anybody wants to take that on? Jump off. <laughs> I, can. I think that the, the whole COP process is designed to facilitate this commitment this uh, human will, this political commitment uh, uh, approach. But the COP process is also um, because everyone has to compromise. And as we all know, when we go for compromise, we don't necessarily get the optimal uh, output. But the good thing, and I congratulate our colleagues from Egypt because you have kept the 1.5 degrees. I've got my Actually, reminding everyone that it's still the target. Uh, we've kept that on the on the table. So there is a um, a, a political will. I would say I, I would say there is that commitment. But like with many things, uh, moving to walking the talk is is harder. And the science is clear. Everyone knows what we need to do. Um, but then when it comes to Operating in democracies where we have to tell people that there are changes that are going to happen, which uh, are not necessarily easy to manage in the immediate. The problem is in the longer term, those changes, those changes get even harder to manage the impacts of, of, of climate change. But I do think that there needs to be a much more uh, engaged understanding uh, on, on what is needed on, on the, I would say the immediate steps. We sometimes need to break it down into immediate steps. And this is where I think in, in Africa, the focus must be on energy access. And we need to look at the realities that in the vast majority of cases, probably nine out of 10, renewable energy will be the cheapest and most, uh, most viable option. But in some cases, to make sure that you can get that renewable energy on board, you need to address the storage capacity and, and so on and so forth. But in terms of the, the cost, we are already at a, a stage where renewable energy outperforms uh, traditional fossil fuel uh, generation in a, in, in a dramatic way. 
So I think the, the question of political will is, is demonstrating it. We need, in Africa, that's the, the challenge. The countries that have made very strong commitments have not seen that investment come. And I think that's where we need to walk the talk. We need to show how it's done. Just a second. Oh, just one thing. I should also mention the, the Green Recovery Action Plan, which was mentioned, yeah. which is a very strong commitment by Africa uh, in terms of, of where we want to go. Sorry. Sorry Thank about you. that. Thank you, thank you John Paul. Uh, there's a question from the front. I'm gonna uh, bounce on Sebastian's uh, uh, idea about uh, waiting short term with climate change. Uh, um, so I think um, starting from COP19, we have seen this uh, move towards um uh, green considerations when actually rebuilding uh, crumbling economies and um, um, uh, the ones heavily criticized for example green deal that uh, have encompassed too many elements and were actually confusing because they were encompassing um uh, economic recovery uh, the job market uh, etc but also green transition uh, they are now the, they were after the COVID the pandemic, the lifeline out of uh, this crisis. So, uh, my question is, uh, how can we institutionalize this kind of uh, um, uh, long-termism in, uh, uh, in African countries and how can the EU help in this regard? Okay. Let, let me ask uh, Sebastian to take this question on. Yes, uh, thank you. I hope I understood the question uh, correctly. The sound was not perfect on my end, but um, I would say that the 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 most important step would be that, um, as I said before, every country will have its own its own narrative, its own storyline, uh, and therefore the the long term planning process must be institutionalized in in e in each country through ideally dedicated agencies, dedicated uh, governmental bodies that are charged with uh, with uh, with you know setting the setting out the lines for this for this long term uh, transition and in some countries this is already the case there are there are good examples where this is already happening um and uh and the i guess the long term dream should be that every country has the institutional capacity uh to uh, to do this planning uh both in terms of you know what it would mean technically what it would mean economically uh, what it would mean in terms of investment and so on and so forth um uh, to, to to chart out roadmaps for the country that provide a clear signal to 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 investors uh, and 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 to policymakers elsewhere um, in terms of what what is required in this country, how big are the needs uh, and how big are the investments that that need to be made. So I would say that in the cases where uh, in, in in the countries where this capacity is not yet uh, is not yet present in that form, there is potentially a big role to play in terms of in terms of um, capacity building um, from uh, from the European side uh, to 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 support countries in setting up these these kinds of institutions, uh, which will prevent in the in the long term that uh, uh, that countries rely on external consultants to to draw up roadmaps, but making sure that they have the um, in house capacity uh, to uh, to draw up these uh, these roadmaps. I hope that answers the question. Yes, I think so. Um, comment from Kathleen. What's for me was from somebody online. Oh, okay. um, from the EAS is actually asking that there is a rather advanced cooperation between Europe and Africa on science, technology, and innovation. And his question to the panelists is how could this cooperation contribute to the energy topic? In other words, in which sectors would you suggest to concentrate research efforts? Which ones are most promising and have the most potential to improve energy access in Africa? Okay, um, I'll ask any of the panelists here who has the appetite to take it on. Uh, I, I think maybe both of us can, can have a go. Uh, firstly, I think there's, there's, the, uh, there's some very interesting things happening in green hydrogen. Uh, there's been a huge, in, a huge investment by Germany, for example, in Namibia on uh, researching uh, green hydrogen. Egypt have also made a big announcement on, on green hydrogen. 
uh, and Africa is at the forefront, really, of, of the research happening in green hydrogen. Uh, and I think that we need to continue to build on that. Uh, my, my point will still be that even when we're looking at the R&D, the research and development, we must be looking at it in a way whereby we are anticipating uh, value chains and production happening on the African continent. So not simply, because I think this is one of the biggest issues. Uh, in, in, so far, Africa's energy issues are that we are, um, what the fossil fuels that we produce are exported mostly, mm -hmm. and then often we have to re-import for our own use. And if you can create a value chain within the continent, which is actually then connected to the economy, it creates its own dynamic in terms of then stimulating and incentivizing the right type of investment and growth. But we need to kick it off, and it's not happening yet. I mean, to, to respond to, to, to the question before, uh, on the human approach of, uh, of this challenge, I think that uh, to tackle the, the global challenge of climate change, um, we have to accelerate the green transition or the green transformation. Uh, and it is also dynamic uh, to, uh, to accelerate sustainable growth and uh, this is job creation. And I think uh, even uh, the funding, the loss of demand funding, has uh, not to finance only uh, infrastructure or uh, damage, but damage on, uh, on, uh, on life, on uh, and I think that uh, the question has uh, health systems for education and so on will be uh, present in, 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 the, in the program or, or the intervention of the song. And you have uh, on all the African countries, I think, but in Europe also, uh, social, social civil society has uh, a voice now. She has, has not the uh, capacity to 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 make decision, but I think that uh, um, COPS uh, twenty seven, uh, the voice of 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 uh, society, uh, civil society was uh, heard, and I think that the think tank are uh, also the intermediate for uh, keeping this question of uh, the impact of human dimension. Of the challenge on, on, the, on the room of, uh, of the all the initiatives uh, in hydrogen, I think that it is uh, actually it is in the debate, but uh, it is a it, a complex question, technical and financial uh, dimension. I think that uh, it is uh, it is an opportunity. To, because many many countries in, in in Africa, in North Africa, or in uh, sub-Saharan uh, countries, have a huge potential in hydrogen. But the huge potential uh, uh, needs finance and needs appropriation of technology. And there is a great competition on technology in this in this uh, in this source of energy: China, United States, India, and so on. And we have to be aware to choose technology and to mobilize resources to have this capacity to to, to, appro to appropriate this, this sort of energy in, in the future. Thank you, Prof. Let's have a reaction from Elizabeth uh, and Sebastian. Yes, thanks. Um, on, on the also technology and innovations and I think in the Stockholm plus 50 report uh, um, uh, by the Stockholm Environment Institute and I think there was an interesting concept of uh, idea of um, moving away from just transfer of technology to actually moving to co-development of technology and I think it what it means is also with me what John Paul was saying that it's also it's it's also about uh, building the production uh, chains in the countries and, and the innovation or even like very early the innovation um, uh, steps and so on for, for new technologies and not just bring the technologies. 
to to Africa. And I also think it's important. Another issue I think where it's important is to invest in um, the, the scenario building, like a research capacities for for uh, um, scenarios for different sectors. That um, I mean, it's we, we do this in Europe for for decarbonizing our different sectors, and and that in 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 different African contexts, it would be also about. Um, what would be the different development pathways for an industrialization pathways, and how could how could they be be done in a way that um, that decarbonizes from from the beginning, or at least in the next uh, ten to twenty years, and so on. And I, I think there are interesting initiatives that uh, Europe could invest uh, more in. And we have the example in in Senegal, where actually now that the ChatP discussions are ongoing, there's actually there is a um, there is such a research project going on, and they receive a lot of pressure because everyone wants these scenarios um, so that uh, they can get on 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 on, a, on the same page on, on these very difficult questions on what will be the place of renewables, what will be the place of gas, for how long, for what uses, export and domestic use. So there's a lot of difficult questions and so it's important to have these kind of scenarios uh, that could help and um, also on the green hydrogen I, I I agree and maybe especially also on uh, its applications for for heavy industries um, and also again here I very much agree with Jean-Paul on saying that for the Namibia Germany partnership hydrogen actually at the moment I wonder because it would, will not make a lot of sense to actually export Green hydrogen from Namibia to Germany, I think that would, might be expensive, um, but it would make much more sense to export already transformed uh, products and and to build uh, industrial um, parts of the industrial chains already in Namibia. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. Um, Sebastian, any closing words on that? Yes, let me just just say two things. Um, I think that the first thing. Uh, just to quickly come back to what Elizabeth was saying is that uh, I, I don't think Namibia will ever export hydrogen in, in the pure form to uh, to Europe uh, just because of the physics of how hydrogen works. It would already be in the f in the shape of a product uh, such as ammonia uh, for, for 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 fertilizer. Um, but um, I think I, I agree with everything that has been said. However, I would like to just and I'm repeating myself a bit. But I want to caution against falling into this trap of um, generalized narratives here. Um, just to take the hydrogen example, yes, it is important. There is potential. It could be interesting to, to decarbonize hard to abate sectors. But some countries in Africa will never export hydrogen or the derivatives of hydrogen um, simply because of the particular circumstances of where they are located, what the potential is, and so on. Um, so let, let, let's not, let's not, this is one of the generalizations, uh, or the, the misguided one size fits all solutions that have modeled the debate a bit that, uh, that everyone is now saying, well, the, the potential for hydrogen in Africa is, 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 is huge. African countries should export hydrogen to Europe and earn revenue. Um, this kind of narrative is too generalized and, 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 and trying too much in vain to search for one size fits all solutions as to be actually helpful. So let's, let's just be mindful of that also um, in the search for, uh, you know, research topics on which to, on which to collaborate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, uh, unfortunately, the time is already gone past six o'clock, so we need to be wrapping up. Um, so I think uh, it would be very difficult to summarize what has been said, but a lot of things have been said. Uh, and um, just, just quickly, um, clearly, when you take Africa's case, uh, the focus should be on energy access. Um, and as has been repeated over and over again, there, there shouldn't be a one size fits all solution because every, every country's narrative is, uh, situation is different. Uh, so we have to look at country specific um, um, solutions. Now, uh, African countries have shown very ambitious um, uh, intentions to reduce emissions based on the NDCs. Uh, based on the uh, green green um, 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 action program that has been uh, outlined, uh, but what, what is very important is to link the uh, and John Paul actually talked about linking the transition to actually transformation to talk in terms of transformation, uh, which, which will actually then uh, spare development and, and actually improve the lives of the people. Uh, so it's really very important to also focus on value chains. Uh, and production needs across the continent. 
Um, and what came out is that uh, there are various challenges. Uh, I wouldn't go through all of them, but clearly from the EU side, what could really help is um, capacity building and um, assistance with technical uh, um, um, uh, support uh, and also um, investment as well. Uh, and one thing that came out is that um, from COP27, most of the initiatives uh, were mitigation related. Uh, and as we mentioned, there's, there's a need going forward to look at the case of adaptation. I think Prof mentioned that, that point. Uh, so um, let me hand it back to Kathleen. Um, I'm not sure what happens now. <laughs> if you can wrap it up for us. Thank you very much. Uh, again, I think this was indeed a, an extremely interesting discussion, a good start of, of the series. Um, we want to finish nicely with having a drink and a, a few things to eat to continue the discussion. I think we are having it uh, downstairs. I just want to thank in particular all the participants, the panelists, of course, our partners, Egypt, and the different think tanks, um, also the African Union Commission, and, and uh, let's continue on this track and also uh, build on, on some of the good recommendations that are coming that we can really use in our uh, continued work uh, in this partnership. Thank you very much. Thank you.